audience today, and I am just bursting with pride uh, to have the walls joining us here in the 305. So, Matt, Steve, can you come up? non-technician. He didn't understand the insides of computers well. He couldn't create the insides himself, but he understood people and what people wanted. And he was always trying to build computers for himself, for somebody that he understood. And he failed and failed and failed because the early days of computers, computers was those people that knew how to follow engineering steps and make things that actually worked. And Steve wasn't one of those, he was somebody that just had a life and wanted to get to a point <coughs> where the things a normal person does in life make sense and the technology doesn't matter. You don't want to have megahertz and interrupt pins on microprocessors. You don't want all these technical jargon and words and meaning because it was out of his understanding. Now eventually we got to the internet. Steve's experience with computers had been in high school, sitting on a teletype terminal, one of those expensive teletypes that could print and it had a keyboard, chung, 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 chung. Kind of slow, but it cost as much as a couple of cars. And in the high school, when Steve went, um, didn't have it when I was in high school, we didn't have any computer stuff, you could type in a program or access to a computer, small little things, and the computer was way off through a modem and the phone lines, and it connected to a GE system somewhere and a, a computer that you could actually use. It was called time sharing. So Steve's mental knowledge of computers, he didn't know the insides or how to have a computer in his house, what he would do with it, flip the switches and understand all that, but he just knew that a computer is far away and you can deal at more of a human level locally. And look what we've gotten to, you know, people like to talk about our products here are, um, are smart computers, a million or a billion times better than they had when I was you know, a young student in school, a very powerful computer in our hands, but actually we've gotten to where our computers are way out there in the cloud, doing all the analysis of huge amounts of data and telling our little devices in our hand what to display. So these devices have become more what the real person wants. I might want to open my car door because I forgot the key. I might want to honk the car horn at home just to let my wife know I'm thinking of her. <laughs> Sometimes at 4.30 4 in the morning she wonders why FedEx is there honking. Um, and so, so basically, you know, it was that world that we'd have enough mobile internet. The inter cellular came along. Cellular wasn't there when we started Apple. When we started Apple, the amount of memory to hold a song cost maybe upwards of towards a million dollars. Okay, now you can, how could you ever envision a world at that stage where songs are just common? You just put them on your, all your media and you have access to them and now they're just out in the cloud and they're streaming. Um, it was, so we were thinking of a very different world when we started. If what we thought computers would be useful to, for people in their own homes, if we had been right and that had been true, Oh, you could store your family recipes. Oh, you could um, balance your checkbook with a lot of hassle and time and reading cassette tapes in. If that was true, this industry never would have taken off. It would have just died right away early and uh, been the purview of small hobbyists. And of course, sometimes you don't know that the industry is going to become big and important in money terms because all of the big companies that make products and have a lot of money and wealth, all those companies would have smart people that are looking out. What is going to be the next big thing? What is going to, where can we make our money? And they all said these little small computers aren't going to be able to do the jobs computers do and they aren't going to be useful to people. And so it was kind of a dichotomy. We believed in our revolution and the forces from the computers of the past believed that the small ones just weren't going to be it. The first attempts to build small inexpensive computers were based around copying the old formula of the big mainframes and 
big long buses and plugging in lots of hardware. And it's an expensive, expensive solution. So we needed to find ways to make a useful computer that could help people affordable. And that was my key role. I developed a couple of those, the Apple I and the Apple II, that just totally jumped ahead of the rest of the world and, and led the way for quite a while. When you lead the way, you have a huge advantage. A lot of people say, why is Silicon Valley Silicon Valley? Why is it so prominent in electronics and everything? Well, it turns out that if you have something that grows and increases and increases and increases over time, think of Moore's Law. More transitions, more electronic neurons for the same price. Year after year after year after year, you wind up with a product that's 10 billion times for the same cost. You wind up with that. The Everything that we have today in our digital technology is based upon one little part called a transistor. Transistor was invented before 1950, and one of the inventors moved to Silicon Valley and set up an early company. And then engineers learned the transistor technology and split off to form another company. And out of that one, Fairchild, other companies split out. Marine, people were getting the formula for building the transistor, and the transistor was going to go up and up and up economically, and that's really what made Silicon Valley. An early start in the technology that was going to be the future. And the funny thing is, the future wasn't one year away, two years away. In the first maybe 10 years of transistors, they were so expensive, only the military could afford them. And here was Lockheed Martin Space um, um, Company in Sunnyvale, California, in Silicon Valley. Oh my gosh, every time we get a chip with six transistors on one piece of silicon, a chip, we save weight. And in the early days of the space race, every little gram you could save of weight was equivalent to you know tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands today of dollars in money to uh, to get into space. So so it was a combination of our desire, the, the government who could afford things, desire to get into space and the new silicon technologies. But out of that, we wound up with an awful lot of companies, and entrepreneurship didn't exist like today. It was more like if you had a company and you knew how to do it, you could spin off a bunch of executives and some of the people who had made their money in the area would fund you and the venture capitalism grew up without the idea that young people with an idea could come and design things. It was only like people who were already doing things could start a similar company and do, it on the, do another one on the side. Spin outs instead of entrepreneurship. And that was pretty much the heart of Silicon Valley. Um, so to get to today, there were a lot of steps Every step, personal computer said a computer is not a big blank, you know, faceplate with all these switches and little nomenclature that nobody can understand except the expert who has been trained to run it. And then we move towards a human keyboard. It looks like a typewriter. A keyboard and a video display was the only cheap output device. If you owned a television, a video display was free. Input-output was the most expensive part that was keeping us from getting to affordable computers for a long time. So we made life easy and more human, the way humans were used to. I can type things, and I can see it on a screen, and I can actually uh, um, run programs, too. Um, and that was a start. Now we took a step at a later year. I mean, eventually you could plug in a lot of accessories. Our Apple II was a totally open project. The opposite of an apple you hear about today. Totally open, we, we distributed our designs, our schematics, they were mine really, and all of our code, all my code, and everybody could analyze it and say, oh my gosh, I sort of understand how these computers work. I see how you write programs. They could say, this is what I want to do for my life. So a lot of people at a young age, their parents bought them an Apple II computer and they wind up being CEOs of companies. Now, the Apple II computer was a very special product. It wasn't just one attempt to help start Apple Computer. The Apple II, I had designed games for Atari, video games. The arcade industry was starting. It was going to become a huge industry. And the arcade games were all black and white <clears throat> for cost reasons and technology reasons. It was hard to do color. And they were all hardware designs. Hardware means you solder wires on chips to get signals to go at the right timing. And it's so difficult. You could have a simple arcade game that took 100 chips or, or 
150 chips, huge designs. I hate that. I, I li only like things very small. Well, the Apple II computer was the first time that arcade games would be color. I had this dream of how beautiful games would be in color, and then instead of a $5,000 device to create color, I thought of a way to do it for zero dollars. It's weird, but instead of putting a number into an electronic device that I knew how to design with differential calculus and everything, um, that would put a, a color signal on a TV, I realized that the number itself in memory, if you put it on a wire into the TV, it turned into color. Don't ask me how I came up with that idea, I still don't know. <laughs> I do know that I was doing a job for Atari and I was four days and nights without sleep, and your head kind of wanders into creative space in that environment. So, it was, the Apple II was the first time ever arcade games would be color, more importantly, the first time ever arcade games would be software instead of hardware, meaning a nine-year-old kid could write a program saying vertical equals one, vertical equals two, vertical equals three, and make things move on a screen. It was that easy to make things move on a screen for a normal person, not an engineer. So this was a huge step. That product was going to be big and so far ahead of the rest of the world. Uh, we wouldn't have to continually raise round after round after round of funding either. And Apple had two starts. We started once with the Apple One. It's kind of called the garage days, although we never had a company in a garage. The garage represents the fact you have to work at home when you have no money. Steve Jobs and myself had no savings accounts. We're in our young 20s. We have no business experience. So that was the Apple One days, and we started with three people. Steve and I and Ron Wayne had 10%. But Ron sold his out after a few weeks for some hundreds of dollars. See, I'm going to interrupt you for one Well, we're going to, I think we're going to move on to a different part of the program. Yeah, so uh, I want to introduce you to the person that's actually responsible for CNBC being here, our great friend Melissa Lee, that will uh, uh, carry on with us. All right. Yes, I had a very nice interview with CNBC. I didn't know how to invite you on. So I have more to tell, but it'll come out. It'll come out. Why don't we sit? Yeah. Yeah. I figured I had the whole hour to myself. <laughs> I'll ask you very short questions. How's that? Um, you're discussing Apple at length, obviously. Everybody wants to hear about Apple. What do people want to know about Apple today? What's your opinion of the company today? It's getting a, the rap of not being innovative enough. Or well, not being the larger anything enough. is, think about physics. If you have a small little marble, it's easy to push it. You've got a big heavy car, push and push and it barely moves. The larger something is, the slower it tends to move. And also, um, in our early days of Apple, since I did all of the design and the technology work and the software and the hardware and the fixing <laughs> and the testing and every little bit of it myself, I never had to rely on committees doing individual parts of it. So there's a lot of things that slow big companies down um, into taking the next step and all that. And sometimes people think, oh, it's not innovative. They aren't coming out with a whole new class of product. And I very much disagree. Yeah. Uh, Apple today, uh, we've got, it was the first company to put Touch ID on. I mean, I love that Touch ID to identify myself instead of having to memorize passwords all the time, especially on my computer. You've got Touch ID now on your MacBook Pro with, from Apple. But every other company that makes smartphones followed Apple's lead. Look who the leader is. You know, they followed. This was an important thing that would change a lot of how we do things in our life in a significant way. It wasn't just a fun, fancy feature. It wasn't just a little better, better camera. People say, oh, I have this phone because it has a better camera. No, your choice to pick a phone has nothing to do with camera. They're all so good now. Um, Apple was also the, um, um, I, there were Android phones. I, I like to buy a lot of, I use, I use all five different carriers in the United States on my phones to compare them. Um, AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile. Which one's the best? Because I'm going to be interviewing the CEO of Sprint right afterwards. So <laughs> it's difficult to say. I don't want to say one best one, but one very clever one and creative one is Google Project 5. <laughs> and they send you a SIM card, and it picks the best of T-Mobile, Sprint, or Wi-Fi, wherever you are. But in addition, and it has a low cost for data, for voice, for um, uh, text and all that. It's got you know, normal low pricing but it works, it applies to 115 countries. So that's, that's a real nice one. And they send you a second card, you order extra SIM cards for data only devices like iPads, and you can, and the cards come for zero dollars. No shipping charge even. And it comes in the mail, and plug it into your iPad Pro, 
And my gosh, your iPad Pro now is using data on your Project Fi account. <coughs> I like it because it's so unusual. It's not like the normal carrier mode that you're, we're all used to. <coughs> and I won't pick a favorite among carriers. I've gone back and forth a lot of times myself. So. Um, but just to get back to the notion of, of Apple being a very large company, and after you get to be a certain size, it's it's more difficult to be the same Apple that you were when it was you and Steve and a handful of other people. Is that what, I mean, there are a lot of entrepreneurs in the audience. Is that one of the greatest enemies to true innovation, getting to a size where you're just too big? Does it well, have to Apple, be that way? but Apple's been the most successful leader at being very large and coming out with new direction products like iPods, iPhones, iPads, um, that was very strange. Normally you think those come out of some young person who doesn't know what, what you know, that this is not going to be valuable and they create something very different that didn't exist before. Of course, smartphones existed, but Apple did it so, so well and so right. And I really actually think a lot of the key to great products is some level of secrecy. You know, not having everybody looking over your shoulder and commenting on what you're doing and knowing every detail of it, you know. So Apple got a little tighter when Steve Jobs returned. Right, I mean, and that, sort of, that was a commentary given by Tim Cook in the latest earnings release that people were sort of seeing a preview of what the iPhone 8 could be and so therefore they weren't selling as many 7s as they had expected and that was the reason behind the slight dip in, in sales in that quarter. What, I mean, when you say secrecy, how secret does it have to be? Because I feel like there, there are blogs out there with little incremental details about the next great iPhone and everybody reads them. Everybody knows it's going to be OLED screen. Everybody knows it's going to be end-to-end -end glass. Every, I mean, these, these are common knowledge things now about the iPhone 8, which is not released yet. These are common rumors. And sometimes the rumors <laughs> turn out to be quite wrong, I found out. So, um, so uh, and they, they all sound like good things, but they don't sound like the real, the features they can call true innovation, like a whole new category of product. Let's wait till, let's wait till it's in our hands and how we use it. Um, I think a lot of the differences in, in recent, the last decade, so even from Apple, have largely been in the software area. You know, what sort of features are built, are in the phone is capable of. A bit of hardware, so look, just gotta wait and see. Um, pretty much you're in one camp or the other, and you're not based on, here's the features and the speed and the, the full screen and the OLED display. You're not really basing it on that anymore. It's pretty much, do you trust a company? Apple has a brand because it has an awful lot of trust from us that everything that, that comes out is going to be complete enough and it's going to work well and, and be simple. A lot of people will understand it. And it's, you know, it's basically a matter of trust. Why do you think Apple has not been disrupted yet? Or do you think it has been disrupted in other ways? Because if you think about some other industries, for instance, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you wouldn't have thought a Tesla, for instance, would be at the forefront or, you know, what comes to mind when you think of electric electric vehicles. You just wouldn't. You would have thought that one of the big three would have been, and yet here they are with a bigger market cap than Ford. Sure, than I was telling you backstage, when <laughs> Uber came along, I thought it wasn't going to succeed. Right. We it's have cars, we have taxis. <laughs> Why do you think <laughs> Apple has not been disrupted? Um, or do you think maybe you know what? Has? Well, for one thing, Apple has had a healthy financial organization um, where good business models, whereby by keeping the customers, by being true to the customers, we can make a little profit. The brand is worth a little profit. We can build a computer with the same sort of chips as another manufacturer or a phone with the same chips, the same style, the same features and cameras and all that. And then we get a little bit higher um, price on it for the, the brand recognition. And Apple's been very successful at obviously saving an awful lot of money. When you're that large and you have a huge cash outlay, you can invest, you can spot the newest technologies. I remember Siri. Siri is so important to our world. It was the first of these various assistants that are out now. And Siri, for one year, was a third-party app. Okay, what's changed your life the most in smartphones? I would say the App Store. Not the product, the iPhone, but the App Store has changed my life the most. Siri was a, an app. And I discovered I could ask Siri questions like, what are the five largest lakes in California? What are the prime numbers greater than 87? And it would give me answers back like a human did. And I spoke about it on stage. The only person I ever got to buy Siri was my wife. And then Apple bought it. So, well, of course, the week Apple bought it, it's funny, I'd be on stage. One of the five largest lakes in California, and it would come back with all this lakefront real estate stuff. And I'd say, what are the prime numbers greater than 87? Joe's prime rib joint. <laughs> so, 
it's gotten better, but it gets better, it gets better. I like the machines to understand me as a human being. One time, I was in the San Francisco airport, Apple came out with a product, an early tablet called the Newton Message Pad. And I didn't know much about it, because I'd been going back to school to get my college degree for a year. And I'm, I'm, and I'm in, so I'm in the San Francisco airport with my kids flying to Disney World. I'm Orlando. And I got, um, I opened up the box. This beautiful device. I discovered you could handwrite with your human muscles words, and it knew what the words were. And then I, and then I got a phone call, so I, I wrote a little message to myself. Sarah, dentist, Tuesday, 2 p.m. A reminder to me. To me. And I, I, I'm looking around, there's a button called assist, some kind of menu. You know, you always want to explore the menus. I clicked assist, and it opened up the calendar. Tuesday at 2 p.m., it put the word dentist, and it grabbed Sarah out of my contact list. And I said, I wrote a note for a human being, and the machine understood it. And it, it was a changing point in my life. I want to live as much as I can in a human world. I want to say things, I want to write them, and have the machines understand what my meaning is. When you take a look at how we interact with our technology, how much more human can it get at this point? I mean, there's voice recognition. Oh. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> Siri. Well, Siri is frustrating to some people because very often ask a question and it's, a human being would know exactly what you're asking and Siri misses it. And sometimes it's a strange word. Uh, you know, Siri knows the definition of a glass that you could move on a table, but if there's a politician named Glass and he's in a big scandal this week, somehow what everybody else is searching for, Google tends to understand your, 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 what you're trying to say into the glass. So a lot of times it, it, it gets the words right, but it doesn't understand the internal meaning. And that needs to be improved a lot. But even once that improves, it's not like a human brain. Human brain says, here's a problem, let's solve it. I wonder what an approach would be. I'll find an expert or I'll figure, I know from my own background how to solve it. I'll teach a computer to learn. And in one hour, that, that computer can do it better than any human, play a game better than any human. But the computer didn't say, what should I do? Humans still do that. So. So that's a very, that's a much higher level of consciousness. And yet that's a level of consciousness that people think is, a, is around the corner. People think that machines are going to take over the world. People are already projecting that jobs will be lost because of machines being able to do what humans do and think the way humans think. Well, for quite a while we've had the idea of singularity. Once a computer right. got up to where it kind of had consciousness, feelings, I don't know. Feelings are a human thing. I know feelings that you would feel if we were in a nice breezy beach and the weather was just right, you know, but a computer hasn't lived a human life, so it doesn't know the, everything the same way. But, um, so, so these computers would then start programming themselves. Here is a problem, I will solve it. If they ever, I don't, I, that's, that's too hard to say. We know how much information the brain processes, or we can make a, you know, a ballpark estimate, <coughs> and computers will get that good someday maybe. But processing information, we don't know how the, how the head is really wired. As much as you read in every Scientific American article, and the, this part of the brain does this, and this does that, and that does that, we just don't know how it is all connected. So will we get to that point is one thing. Second of all, if you think of all the issues, to build machines that can actually walk around like a human, go over every obstacle there is, and then and participate in society. And then secondly, if computers ever were, if this big, this idea of computers could take over our jobs, because if they can think better, why have a CEO in a company? If a, co if a slow CEO costs you money, get rid of the CEOs. If a computer's running the whole world, there's that, that theory, and I don't buy into it, because you'd have to change every bit of infrastructure from machines or sending orders to other machines to go out and dig ores and bring materials back and do cleanups. And, Everything in life that uh, there's just way too much to convert. It would take hundreds of years to convert. So I'm not worried about. We're just going to be um, uh, the, the secondary species to machines for quite a long time. That's right. Although we build all this technology to take care of our needs so well, I just have to know what button to push. I don't have to do the work anymore. Um, my gosh, I'm like a house pet. <laughs> my world is taken care of by the machines. And I've got my clothing, and I've got my food, and I've got my housing, and education, entertainment. It's all done. So I'm just a, ha a dog. So I started treating my dogs very specially when I got that idea. You know, filet steaks, and how I'd want to be treated. So, as somebody who uh, is skeptical of, of pure singularity, but appreciates uh, the advances that AI has brought to our lives, where can it go from here? What's the sort of well, maximum range within our lifetime that we can see AI. Do first, you first of all, let humans participate in as humans very much and have the machines enhance our life, our ability to do things. 
are mastery and powerful, being the power of my thought, what I want to do, I can achieve it better because of all this <coughs> equipment, both <coughs> the software smarts and the hardware of the robots and all that. Um, just basically be uh, uh, as helpful as possible to the maximum number of humans. And there are places where it'll replace jobs. Look at car factories. That's already happened. Did it somehow cut us down to not having any jobs? No, people eventually, over time, society has seeks equilibrium and everyone winds up basically with a job. So it does just because one category of job disappears doesn't mean others are coming in now in the future. So I, I, I don't really buy into a lot of this, oh my gosh, you know, machines and technology are, are a really great threat. It's just, it makes our life more optimal so we can have more things. Right. You know, you get, you get, if you get something for less money, that uh, just means you have a little more money to have something else. Um, we are going to open it up to Q&A for Steve, so get your questions in mind, but before we do that, I just want to ask you a couple more questions, particularly about innovation. Um, what company in Silicon Valley or outside of Silicon Valley right now do you think is the most disruptive, the most innovative company out there? And I've heard in the past that you've said Tesla. Okay, recently I was asked a question that was framed a certain way by the media, by financial press, which I'm not the one for. I've never even used Apple stock app. I don't follow stocks. I don't want an unhappy life of I'm always chasing where things are every day. So I was asked a question and the headlines came up. Steve Wozniak doesn't think Apple is innovative. I'm glad we can clarify this then. Well, I had been on stage that, that same day as that interview. I'd been on stage explaining why Apple was doing things that were truly innovative in our lives compared to other companies that were following. And I gave examples, and I said, and there were even other ways I spoke about Apple that way. The only thing I've ever said privately or on stage that's sort of negative about Apple is that, um, well, I might say Google is sort of a leader in artificial intelligence. Their Google Assistant thinks of things that Siri doesn't, but I don't know. Uh, but very little. I'll compare other products because I use them all, but I don't say Apple's not innovative, so the headlines, yeah, it messes you up. And the trouble is, questions by the media can be phrased a certain way, and they want the sensationalist headline because it gets more readers and more money. Okay, I'll re ask the question then. Because <laughs> clearly you believe okay. that Apple is who innovative, is? but who is the most innovative? The way you phrase, you phrase it, most innovative, the one that I follow, of course, the trouble is, I don't know what Apple's doing that's innovative inside. And I do know everything Tesla's doing. Oh my gosh, they're doing some boring tunnels under the ground for transportation in LA. And they're doing the Hyperloop, which might connect cities in Europe. And they're doing uh, the electric cars. And I love that. I got into the electric car world when my wife finally let me buy a Tesla. And, and it is so nice. I do not want to visit gas stations. I'd much rather, even on, we take long, long road trips all the time. <laughs> And I'd much rather just plug in and charge for 30 minutes than deal with the gas station um, uncleanliness. So I, I look at electric cars, and then but they're thinking more about this electric car future needs electricity. And where's our electricity coming from? It's coming from dirty coal. You haven't improved over the car much. So a lot of solar cell and batteries to store things, you know, to store things and return energy. Uh, they're like all over the map in so many areas that are maybe five years off, 10 years off, till it's commonplace for everyone. And that's long-term thinking that most companies don't get into. So if you like, admire Tesla for that. If yeah. Elon Musk gave you a call and said, "Hey, Waz, you know, I'm rethinking the center console. What do you think? What do you think of it? And, and how could I improve it?" Get rid of it? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, <laughs> hate, I hate the touchscreen in a car. I'm sure a lot of accidents have been called by people just trying to hang up their phone and hit the right button on that big screen. Um, go to, you know, I, I mean, I'm much like a good, comfortable, attractive. It doesn't take your eyesight with a lot of ton of buttons, a nice little knob like in Mercedes or something to get through menus even while you're driving. Um, so, so, but but I really don't think I would be the um, the right one to give ideas. What what features should be on a center screen and this and that? The center screen makes it stand out as different. And I do a lot of things in my life that are considered a little weird, but they're I do them because they're different. And sometimes if something's interesting, it gets attention and. That's good. And uh, I mean, Tesla's a fine car, it's just high price. Yeah, that's true. Um, is, are there any questions from the audience? We want to make sure that you guys can, can ask what you want. I think we have one right in the center. We have a mic runner. And as far as technology that I love today, my Chevy Bolt, an electric car that can also go anywhere in the country because it has a large enough battery, 60 kilowatt hours. Wow. And it can go anywhere in the charging stations and you can take road trips with it but it's only $30,000 after rebate. 
well, that's a lot more normal pricing yeah. for a car. That's and I'd like to have pricing down for a car that can do the job. No, it's not as nice and luxurious as a Tesla in some ways, but in other ways it has more room and it's more comfortable and places to put things. So there's advantage both ways. And the sound system's better and I listen to music. But the other, the other piece of technology is my Apple Watch. I mean, I just love it. I love every time I use it, it helps me. I love it so much. Not having to grab a phone out of a pocket. I don't like them being one of those people who pulls phones out of pockets. It's like when Steve Jobs and I started Apple, we said, what do we want to do? Well, we wanted to develop a technology that would help blind people become equivalent to sighted people. And everywhere you drive nowadays, you look over on the sidewalk, there's all these people walking along <laughs> looking at their screen, <laughs> blind as anyone. Right. I think we have a question from the audience. Do we have a mic out? Do a mic out? Steve, what are your views of personal privacy in the future? Personal privacy, I'm a strong advocate of personal privacy because all my life I've dealt with thinking about um, the human versus technology. Who's more important? Apple stood out very much for making things easy, understandable, intuitive. Took very many approaches towards the humanness and, um, and a human should even have private areas. My little secrets should be mine. Things that I want to whisper to my wife should be, should be private and I'm one of the founders of the EFF, so that should answer the question. Um, I just think that uh, you're allowed to have, I was brought up with, with the, the um, very constitutional instruction that I bought into, and one of them, the Fourth Amendment, your home is your home, and it cannot be entered and invaded and searched without the proper documents and a warrant. And they're saying, well, my home is where I put my private stuff. Well, now it's all in our computers. So why can they search that? I recently pulled out of an event for the first time in my life. Called up when, you know, the week it was coming up, because it was in Turkey. And I'd have to check my laptop on the way back home, out of my sight, you know, and, and so I, I don't like that. <coughs> Cybersecurity, there's so many ways into our computers nowadays with the internet and the operating systems that are designed for access from the right people from afar, while the wrong people figure out how to get in as the right people. I mean, my Raspberry Pi that lets me see Google from China, okay, because you have to encrypt it and hide the fact you're getting to Google or Facebook to get it from China. Um, so I use a little Raspberry Pi at home, and then I use a $9 chip computer, because I like the cheaper solution over the expensive one. But it, um, but that, but it, um, so it, but I make sure that it won't even, I saw them probing it and trying to guess the root password, trying to guess the root password. Oh my God, this is horrible. So I set mine up so there's no root password even. You don't even have a password. You cannot get into it with a password. It's just encryption code to encryption code. Wow. Anyway, but anyway, I, but I, I, I'm a strong advocate for privacy and and uh, it's been overrun to where anything you've got, we can peek into governments, governments of, of our own and of others. We can peek into your stuff and we have the right to do it and we're gonna make it legal for us to do it. I don't like that and I think it's unconstitutional. Next question. Here's somebody running the mic to somebody else. Who's got the microphone? I'll speak without a mic if you don't mind. He'll speak without a mic and I'll repeat a question. Three hundred thousand uh, computers were affected in, in a day or two. The, the interesting thing is that it was killed by a 22-year-old kid who spent ten dollars and sixty cents to find a backdoor way to kill to kill it. Doesn't it concern you that a 22-year-old kid who actually saved the world in that way could also, uh, you know, do damage in that way? And I speak from experience as my company was a victim of a 15-year series of cyber crimes. And like layers of an onion, only in the last year did we start uncovering this. You know, what, what is someone supposed to do about this? Well, every single day you read about some hundreds of thousands of accounts were, were penetrated, infected, stolen data, or millions of accounts from different places, and it just never stops. It isn't gonna stop by talking words and by all having an opinion of it. Um, I wish there were new processors with security designed in a different way that operating systems could be built that are an awful lot more secure. But here's the problem. 
the CEO of the company is always going to have access to all the data. So if you can just emulate the CEO and pretend to be the CEO, you know, guessing a password, stealing a password, I mean, you're kind of into every bit of data if you work in a company and you can just put it on a flash key. It's very, very difficult. It's something that isn't going to go away easily, and I don't have a real sure answer. Oh, here's how you can lock up your computer. You can install this software. You can put these safeguards on and firewalls and everything. Um, isn't enough. It's just it is a problem in the world that will never go away. Just like terrorism's always been here, and it'll never go away. Next question. Hello. Uh, Steve, you drew a couple of good um, parallels between Apple and how it's stayed uh, such a good innovator despite getting so big. Uh, with the meteoric rise of cryptocurrencies and how they're changing the landscape of the economy, I want to know what your thoughts are for the other big players in the uh, currency realm or anything related to the blockchain technology that is not related but not directly um, related with um, cryptocurrency. Well, I like the blockchain technology. It's every single transaction, the next transaction, every single transaction is noted and saved, and that probably has a lot of good security and looking backwards and traceability aspects to it. It's good. It's probably why a lot of banks are interested in it. Now, Bitcoin is the most well-known cyber currency that really brought all of this to our attention. The blockchain, every little transaction with Bitcoin is recorded and kept forever in a long traceable file. Um, so it's actually kind of, it's not like a totally anonymous system, you know, of finance compared to say a credit card. I remember getting interested in Bitcoin some time ago. It was $70 for a Bitcoin. Man, and I went online and I tried, you know, you had to have a special bank account at a certain bank and I couldn't buy any Bitcoin so I gave up. Then I got them and got in, you know, kind of some of them at the $700 stage and then it went down to $350. Oh my gosh. My bit, I didn't invest. I did it so I could play with Bitcoin. How do you buy things and how do you sell things? So I can go online to certain sites. Um, I forget if Tiger was one of them. And you can actually say, I want to pay with Bitcoin. And here's my Bitcoin number. And a, and a little QR code comes up and you point your phone at it or your device. So I, I found that I could do that. And then I found out when I travel, you can look ahead to a city and find out which hotels, which restaurants, all their capabilities, except Bitcoin. And it's becoming, it's getting there. It's just not there enough to like everything you're used to just, I can buy here, I can sell here. It's not that easy to do yet, but it's getting there. And Bitcoin's way up high now, $2,200 or $2,700 of Bitcoin. I don't know. I was just playing around to find out how to buy and sell stuff. And I didn't care about the fact that I'd lost a ton of money and now I'm way up. But, <laughs> But I still want to, but I want to experiment. But that's, that's Bitcoin. The blockchain technology that it's based on, though, has a lot of other application. And I'm not an expert on it, so I can't give you much deeper than that. But I can sure understand that uh, it has advantages, especially in the banking world. And I know it's been applied to things where people don't really have a, a good banking system. They can't get credit cards in some little, you know, third world countries. And by having ATMs that work on Bitcoin, they can actually um, get some of their life transactions done. We have time for uh, one more question. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Polo Coronado. I'm with Year Up, working with Opportunity Youth. And the question that I have for you is, uh, what, what are the main talent gaps that you're finding here in America? It's uh, all these young adults looking for opportunities. What kind of recommendation would you give them in terms of soft skills, hard skills, so they can have access to the opportunity? Yes, I don't do firing, hiring and firing in business and all that. But everywhere I go in the world, people have the same education. So they have the same skills, really. They have experience. Maybe they aren't really around other companies that they can get into at an early age. But young people being inspired to be entrepreneurs is the most important thing for our world, in my mind. I mean, just having a purpose, motivation. Motivation is worth more than knowledge. It's called skills, knowledge. I learned that as a teacher. Now, you can teach all the right things, and that doesn't matter. If somebody is motivated and wants to do something, wanting, it's emotional, that's the person that's probably going to go out and find a way to actually get it done. Um, and uh, uh, a lot of, there's an awful lot of, all over the world, every, there's places, centers, especially in Latin America, that want to become another Silicon Valley. Well, I already explained Silicon Valley was there to an early time frame of something that was going to rise way up. So get started. Invite the brightest people to your communities and, uh, 
and give them as many facilities as you can, uh, university support and things like that as a government. So that's all I can say on that. All right. Uh, Steve, thank you very much. Steve Wozniak. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, my name is Karen. I'm a 22-year-old entrepreneur from Columbia. I'm over here. Yes. Hi. <laughs> um, so, you know, um, so I'm an entrepreneur working exactly on how technology, how can we can take technology with education to jumpstart the economic growth of my region, of Latin America. I originally knowledge come from, from Colombia. So, two questions. First, it's kind of the same, not really two questions. I know you said it's one. So, um, what, how do you believe, what do you think, because I know you've taught before, kids, technology, that technology can really transform or change education, especially for regions like Latin America. And number two, um, we took the time to prepare this for you. I would like to come hand it to you, if you don't mind, you can take a look. Okay. Um, well, first of all, um, today, Computers are a lot different than when we started Apple Computer. When we started Apple Computer, a computer was a tool. You could learn how to give it instructions to solve problems. Nowadays, it's, oh, I've got to look around and find somebody else already wrote a program to solve the instructions, and I just have to learn which buttons to push to get to my solutions. So it's a lot different world than being a creator today. It's more being an experienced user is where it's at. Well, what I'm into is creativity. New starting places like Colombia, Bogota, for example. It's like there's a lot of passion and excitement. Throughout Latin America, I see more passion than almost anywhere in the world, except maybe um, Eastern Europe I see a lot. But um, it's like the passion says, I want to be, I want to find things to do that are useful. I want to show other people. I want to do something good in my life. And that's the, that's, that's the most important start. You can find so many answers in books, but now you don't need books. We got the internet. So just go on and explore. What are some of the resources that I might use and what have other people done? And here's an idea. Here's the, a lot of people stop and they say, well, I have an idea, but I don't have tools. I don't have infrastructure. I don't have parts to build something. I'm a little shy there. Well, you should bring that to yourself. It turns out that you can be a builder without any, it doesn't have to go through a normal academic thing or normal society, wherever you are, anywhere in the world. You can order inexpensive kits and parts and, and get yourself a Raspberry Pi, learn how to program that for starters. You can do an awful lot of useful things with it. Um, and so a, lot of these, so a lot of these other places in the world, and look, okay, Silicon Valley has a lot of the big existing companies and a lot of spin-offs, a lot of startups. You could be in Columbia and have maybe some linkage, maybe one of your people or just communication with some Silicon Valley company and kind of be part of it. Young companies, when they're starting up, are very open. They aren't all closed. Oh, we won't let anybody else um, sort of participate with us or see what we're doing. Um, some are very open because they come from younger, idealistic people. And uh, um, I'm very hopeful because everywhere I go, I see so much passion. I think people are, the people want to be in this world of developing new products that change our lives. So I, I don't have anything negative to say. I, I'm, I'm all for it. I'm much more for people in places that don't really have that many things and opportunities and like, oh, we're given it. Silicon Valley, you know what? There's a lot of Silicon Valleys in the United States. There's probably about 25 cities that have large technology communication and then other parts of the world too. And, and they're all roughly equal in that regard. No, you don't have the big, huge unicorn companies, the big, huge unicorn companies. There are a lot of places for people to play now, especially in this modern age of Internet of Things. All right. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, my Thank pleasure. You. Thank you all.